Am I going to lose all of my credibility if I tell you that I went to go and see a musical that depicted Shakespeare using an American accent and I liked it? I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional theatre critic based here in the UK, but I recently took a two-week trip to New York to go and see a bunch of Broadway and off-Broadway shows, including the Broadway transfer of the West End musical and Juliet, currently playing in New York at the Stephen Sondheim Theatre. Now, I may previously have mentioned that I wasn't super interested in seeing this show on Broadway. I saw its out-of-town tryout pre-West End, and then I saw its West End opening night, I saw it in its closing week, I saw it a couple times in the middle. I had seen Anne Juliet a decent amount of times. And to my knowledge, there wasn't anything super different about the Broadway production, other than the fact that they used American accents for all of their characters, kind of like how Six does. But this time around, we ended up with a free midweek matinee, and credit to Anne Juliet, they may not have won the Tony award in this most recent season for best new musical but they may be the last show standing of that tony award season by january what with shucked announcing their closing at the Nederlander theater and kimberly akimbo beginning to slow down so in today's full review i'm going to recap thoughts that i've shared before about the material of this show we're going to address a little bit why it's gone on to be successful on broadway and critically i'm going to talk about each and every one of these performances because at least two of them were my favorites i have ever seen in the role. And to find out who I'm talking about, you will just have to stay tuned for the full review video. But if you enjoy this one, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming soon about various Broadway and West End shows. Also, if you want to see my reviews before anyone else and gain access to early and exclusive content, click on the link in the description and you can sign up to become one of my channel members. For now though, let's talk about And Juliet on Broadway. So if you have no idea what this show is about, because it's, it's a little bit high concept, and the marketing is doing a pretty good job of getting that across, but let me just break it down for you. So this is a story about the opening night of the play Romeo and Juliet, and uh, Shakespeare, who is ready to bask in his success, is met with an unexpected guest, his wife Anne Hathaway. Yes, that's her real name, uh, historically. And she is visiting from their home in Stratford-upon-Avon. And upon hearing the controversial ending to his play Romeo and Juliet, that if you didn't know, and spoiler alert, by the way, ends in a super romantic teenage double suicide, she suggests to him that if they were to write it together, they might be able to come up with a stronger storyline that affords Juliet a young woman who has only known this, her first boyfriend, for less than a week, a little more agency in her own narrative. And what we get is And Juliet, a show about Shakespearean characters, but with a decidedly modern sensibility as they navigate the story of what might have happened if Juliet hadn't killed herself upon finding out that Romeo was dead. All of this scored with music from pop superstar Max Martin, who worked with such iconic groups as the Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears and Katy Perry and Ariana Grande, the best of which you hear in this score. It features songs like Backstreet's Back and I Want It That Way and Stronger and even a little bit of Celine Dion and Oops I Did It Again and Kelly Clarkson's Since You've Been Gone. There are so many great tunes 
in this score, and they all share the connection of being written by Max Martin. So if nothing else, if his is not a name that was already known to you, seeing this show is a great way to find out just how many great songs from the last few decades he's been responsible for. There's even a few that are just nodded to, I've mentioned it before, but there is a fun little moment in the dance break of the song Blow that uses the melody of another Britney song, I Wanna Go. The book, meanwhile, has been written by the Emmy Award winning writer and executive producer of the acclaimed comedy series Schitt's Creek, David West Reed. And he does a fantastic job of combining that modern sensibility that I already mentioned with all of the Shakespearean essentials. There is even a little bit of a moment of pentameter when Shakespeare takes over writing solely by himself after he manages to find an excuse to get Anne to go and disappear for a bit. That's one of my favourite little clever Easter eggs within the script is how the metre of the speech changes when he's responsible for it. But like Shakespeare's writing, it is also riddled with puns that are equal parts playful and terrible, as well they should be. And it's even a little bit educational about Shakespeare. It tells us a a lot of phrases that we still use in modern parlance that William Shakespeare first coined as a playwright. So that's the gist of the show. Juliet decides that she's going to live, goes to Romeo's funeral where she finds out that he actually had a bunch of other lovers he hadn't told her about, including the canonically referenced Rosaline. And then when confronted by her parents who tell her that she's a wayward girl who must go and join a nunnery per their wishes, she decides to run away to Paris with her best friend May, her nurse, as well as a new best friend named named April, who is actually a character created for Anne Hathaway, who decides it would be fun to insert herself into the plot. But when they arrive in Paris and crash the party of a young man named Francois, a party which is being thrown for him by his father Lance, everything quickly gets just as complicated as it was back in Verona. So now that you know a little bit more about the show, let me tell you what I enjoy about it, generally what I think of it, and why it's been successful on Broadway. So I enjoy this show, I do. This will always be a strong four-star piece of theatre for me. I think where it really succeeds is it's fun and it's playful and it's lively. And it does something I like in jukebox musicals, which Mamma Mia kind of pioneered, which is to utilise the songs that it does playfully and in a sort of a tongue-in-cheek, clever way. There's a line in the first act where Francois is nicknamed Frankie by Juliet. And he, in that same scene, says, I want to be able to say I did it my way. So at the end of the first act, when another character sings the song, It's My Life, Shakespeare gets to sing, like Frankie said, and then Francois jumps on from the wings and says, I did it my way. We've already foreshadowed that. And there's another really clever one in the second act uh, that leads up to the line, It's gonna be May, which is this big, fun, playful reveal. Where the material falls down a little bit more, especially in terms of how it utilizes its songs is to do with the character of May. Now, this is a character whose material has been adapted a little bit since uh, they were first performed, because increasingly they have been portrayed by non-binary performers. And it's essentially a non-binary character, even though it doesn't really articulate that within the script. This is a character who is to some extent gender non-conforming and in the midst of a journey of self-discovery with their gender. So nothing is explicitly labeled. And I think there's value in that. I think that's a good thing, especially for a show that's going to be popular with young audiences. Many people will be able to relate to that kind of a journey and someone at that stage of uh, sort of questioning gender norms. Now, when the script got slightly redeveloped, most of which happened in between the show closing for lockdown and then reopening in the West End after lockdown, a lot of specific references to pronouns were excised from the material. There was a throwaway fun line about May wanting to go to Paris and make out with a bunch of random guys. And then that got changed for sort of just like, let's go live our best life, something like that, because no one can be non-binary and slutty apparently, but they may have had their reasons. What makes this difficult is the songs that May sings in the show use pronouns almost exclusively. May sings the Britney song, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman, which does nothing to really clearly articulate their own perspective on their gender identity. Similarly, this is further confused by them singing a duet with Francois, who sings, I kissed a girl and I liked it about May, while May is singing, I kissed a boy and I liked it. And though that lyric has been consciously changed, May replies, you know I'm not a girl, right? Further to this, basically out of necessity, necessity within the plot, May participates in the boy band who are singing the boy bands back. This is questioned by Francois, to which May retorts, the clothes don't necessarily maketh the man, or something like that in a very pointed way, again, about gender. 
And like I said, I don't think it's necessary that we really have to label something, especially when it's a young character being depicted, but it is a decidedly ambiguous depiction of gender nonconformity. Further to this, I think the best character in the show is Anne Hathaway. When I first saw it out of town and people wanted to know what it was like, I said, this is Anne Hathaway's show. She is such a strong character within this plot, even though it's still technically a supporting role. And comparatively, the character of Juliet, even though the show is meant to be about her beginning with agency and making her own choices, it takes her the entire length of the musical for her to make a single choice by herself, basically. And from the earliest marketing materials, I remember this being branded and this being sold as a show where Juliet was going to be this bold, empowered, confident young woman, but it takes her so long to get there. I also think that Romeo is hard done by, and it kind of has to be for this plot to work. We have to root for Juliet and she has to be the more important character to us. But throughout the thing, we are told by other characters that he's a douche and that he is like not someone that she should be resuming a relationship with and he is not good for her. But the greatest mark against him within the context of the show is that he dated other people before he dated her and he may have used the same chat up lines, but that's not to suggest that he didn't feel as strongly about her as he said he did. At no point does it suggest that he had an affair or anything or that he was insincere, just that he dated a lot of people. But I digress. One of the biggest reasons for this show's success, I think, is the incredible work of its creative team. Luke Shepard has done a fantastic job in bringing all of these elements together in this production. It features a great design, the set by Sutra Gilmore, the costumes by Paloma Young. It looks so cool and Shakespearean, yet modern. It's a great fusion of those different styles. Jennifer Webber's choreography is so cool and so contemporary and so youthful, and it gives way to some really fantastic production numbers. And this is the kind of stuff that audiences want in their fun, light, lively musicals. This show has succeeded where similar narratives like Bad Cinderella, like the Britney musical Once Upon a One More Time, have fallen by the wayside. And that's because it benefits from a plot that is largely known to its audience before they go into the theatre, they understand the concept of Romeo and Juliet at least, they know the songs, they enjoy these songs, these are not songs that have been utilised much before on Broadway. I guess it did well to be the first of those three shows to open on Broadway, so everything that came afterwards kind of felt like a comparison to Anne Juliet. And Luke Shepard and Jennifer Webber deliver so many of these really fun powerhouse production numbers, those are the kind of things that will leave audiences talking about the show and attain it a really great word of mouth. Moments like Raw, moments like One Less problem slash can't feel my face. That is such a great number every time. It does come a little abruptly out of the scene that happens before it. I saw a comment recently where someone pointed that out uh, quite smartly but it delivers exuberant, bombastic, colorful, uplifting fun. And that is what audiences want right now. So those have been my thoughts about the show and about how it sits in the Broadway sphere. Let me tell you about these performances because I am dying to let you know. So starring as Juliet, we have Lorna Courtney. And uh, I've mentioned already in this video, I think this is a little bit of a thankless role in many ways. I will say Lorna, out of the four Juliets I've now seen, far and away my favorite. Because I really don't think I have yet seen a performer who sits perfectly within that sweet spot of feeling young enough that it's believable that she's a young woman going on a journey, but old enough that she ought to have her own agency and she ought to be allowed to make her own choices while delivering the pop vocals with enough of a theatrical flair while being able to land the comedy simultaneously. I think the American accent may even help here. David West Reed, the book writer, is Canadian. And I think a lot of specifically Juliet's material and her characterization lands a lot better with an American accent. She feels more like an American teenager. But Lorna does a great job. There are so many dynamite line readings. You really believe all of her relationships with all of the people around her, her friendship with May. And like I mentioned before, the vocals, completely stunning. That's not something every Juliet I've seen before has always been able to deliver. So that was really great. Meanwhile, my other absolute highlight within this cast, Philippe Arroyo, who is playing Francois. And I don't know that this is a difficult part to get right, but this was such a different take on it that made me enjoy the character so much more. I've enjoyed predecessors in this role. I thought Billy was great. I thought Tim was great in London, but they played it as this kind of like slightly cool guy who was just like, ah, oh, go away, dad. I don't want to get married. 
And uh, Philippe, he wore his glasses on stage, which I think was a big help in making him seem like this slightly more Seymour Krellborn kind of nerdy type of a guy. He also characterized it with a lot more nervousness and apprehension, especially in his early meeting with Juliet. But I thought he was really terrific. You got this frustrated passion when he was singing with May, when he was singing What Do You Want From Me? And particularly great, the moment where Juliet sort of jokes about them getting married, uh, you really actually believe that he is proposing. And this kind of, in the West End, always felt like a misunderstanding between the two of them, that he was joking about it as well. And so when she then sings, I think I did it again, to go into Oops, I did it again, and ends up in this position, you think that he didn't mean it either. So you're confused as to why she's interpreting it that way. But here, it feels like he's so awkward and he's just like, oh, well, do you, do you want to get married? Because he just doesn't know what to do and he's so lost and confused. Uh, and I think that works better. I think that's the smarter choice. As Shakespeare, meanwhile, we had Austin Scott. And at this point, this is where I was expecting to have a few reservations about the use of American accents. Because when the show went over to Broadway and when it was announced they were going to be using American accents, I thought, you know what? That's fine. It's not like these characters are meant to be canonically English anyway. It's taking place in Verona, except for Shakespeare. And the idea of William Shakespeare being portrayed as having an American accent always seemed a little bit far-fetched to me, especially when there are potentially audience members who are coming to see the show because they love British things and Shakespeare. It seemed, it seemed odd that he would speak with an American accent. But for whatever reason, maybe just the natural charisma of Austin Scott as a performer, it worked for me. And he may be, at least in terms of like the characterization and the acting performance, my favourite Shakespeare I've seen, not to disparage Oliver Thompson, who I think delivers a show-stopping vocal like no other, Austin Scott made some kind of different, slightly lower vocal choices, which is fine, but this energy that he brought to it, where he was like this cool guy, but you could still see his like neediness and his desperation for validation in the moments like where he's asking Anne if he can get a part in the story as well, and he ends up being the carriage driver, when he's like turning to the audience and doing his puns in the middle of the two of them, having arguments. It really works. He's got a great read on the character, a great read on the comedy, and a lot of the natural confidence that it takes to play this sort of an outgrown boy band kind of a character. That's what Shakespeare is in this show. While the other still very much undergrown boy band character is Romeo. Surprise, surprise, Romeo does feature in this story. And at this performance was played by a terrific understudy, Daniel J. Maldonado. And he was great. He was giving firecracker vocals. He understood all of the comedy of that character as well when he is coming back from the dead and putting on his little backpack and excitedly getting ready to go and woo Juliet again. He understands how to play it like a child and like a young man simultaneously. He's like this heartthrob, but this cartoonish kind of a heartthrob who doesn't have much of a brain. I still think he's hard done by as a character in this script, but he made it very funny. And it was genuinely heartwarming when he was singing One More Try with Juliet and reflecting on each of their ability to make their own choices and go on to lead their own lives. We also had Justin David Sullivan as May. Justin, who made headlines earlier this year for removing themselves from Tony Awards eligibility, because as it stands, there is no category in which a non-binary performer can be nominated and awarded for their acting performance. Justin plays May with a tremendous amount of sincerity and sensitivity. I wasn't wholly convinced by the vocal performance throughout, just because it felt more like a pop vocal, which you would think would be at place in this show, but in this theatrical context on this big a stage, you still need a certain amount of power and stamina to be able to put across these big songs, especially the way that I'm Not A Girl, Not Yet A Woman has been arranged for this show. It's a, a soaring ballad of a thing. The characterization was there, the woe and the heartbreak came through particularly strongly. Next, we had Tian and Tuncliffe, another understudy from the cast, who was taking on the role of Anne Hathaway. It was a shame not to see Betsy Wolfe, who was Tony nominated for her performance in the show, but Tiernan did a great job and looks a lot like Betsy Wolf actually, though she does feel younger because she is younger and she's ticking all the boxes. She's landing the comedy lines with the right rhythm. She is knocking the vocals out of the park. Anne Hathaway is a great role. I just feel like to a certain extent, this is stacked against her. It's almost as though this is an understudy track that has in itself been 
miscast because the problem is she just reads far too young. She just about gets away with being the wife of William Shakespeare, but she feels like his much younger wife. When we learn in the show, she's actually older than he is. And there are a handful of references about how it's a little odd that she has inserted herself into the plot to be portraying herself as a best friend of these other two young characters when she is discernibly older. So when she's not discernibly older, which Tiernan isn't at all, those lines don't work. The joke when they say, let's just say we're all in our 20s, and then William says to Anne, you're all in your 20s, meaning that's not believable, it doesn't land, because it is believable, because she's in her 20s. There's another moment later when she's confiding in Juliet about her past and saying this all happened a long time ago. Um, I mean very recently, because I'm young, like you. Again, that doesn't land because it doesn't make sense to us. Finally, we have one last romantic coupling. We have Lance Dubois, played by the iconic performer Paolo Schott, and the nurse, played by the equally iconic performer Melanie LeBarry. Melanie is one of the show's original West End cast members who got the chance to go over to Broadway with this show. She is an icon among the West End community for her talent and her spirit. She's a wonderful human being. And though I didn't see every performer in the West End who played this role, I have yet to see one who has been able to wrestle the nurse away from her unmistakable original interpretation of this part. She has so clearly put her own stamp on it in terms of the mannerisms, in terms of the line readings, in terms of the comedy that works specifically in her accent, the sass she brings to it, the side eye that she delivers to the audience. Nobody has been funnier in this role, and she brings so much vocal fireworks to it as well. When she sings these uh, solo lines in the middle of group numbers, or when she's singing uh, Break Free slash Teenage Dream with Lance, it's great stuff. And when she sings the pink song Effing Perfect to Juliet in the second act, it's, it's damn near a show-stopping number because she puts so much emotion and heart into it. She is first and foremost a phenomenal actress. I don't know how much longer she is going to be in the show on Broadway, so my advice to you would be to make sure you get tickets before Melanie leaves. She is absolutely worth seeing. And then finally, as I mentioned, Paolo Schott, who is playing Lance. This is a really fun role, and maybe I was spoiled a little bit with the performance of David Bedella in The West End, who is a master at taking these roles and infusing them with so much depth and making them seem uh, so important and, and giving them so much dimension. And uh, Paolo feels a little bit more inconsequential to everything that's going on on Broadway. I think it's difficult to make this character enduringly likable because from what it seems, he is very much disregarding the welfare and interests of his son just so that he can resume a relationship with the woman that he was having an extramarital affair with decades before. And I think the way around that is to portray the passion, the passionate love that exists with everyone in his life. And he has this kind of sense of hysteria about all of that. I don't know if the accent because uh, he does a French accent in the show, and then there's a joke about it at the end where Shakespeare says to Romeo, we're not doing accents, and then Lance says, wait, we're not doing accents? I don't know if that didn't land as much as a punchline at this performance because it doesn't contrast as much with the American accents. You would have thought that it did, but uh, I guess with Melanie having an accent and with him having an accent and with him being a Brazilian, I believe, performer to begin with. I don't know whether the intention behind that just got a little bit murky and whether it needs to be a thicker, more ridiculous French accent. Perhaps. I do not know. But again, as expected, vocal delivery, phenomenal. He's been in shows before, like uh, like South Pacific at Lincoln Center. He has a booming, beautiful classical voice. It's almost wasted on the pop material, but he does a lovely job, especially when he's singing uh, with his son at the end and he's singing Show Me the Shape of Your Heart. That's a lovely moment. But those have been my thoughts about, where's the playbill? <gasps> and Juliet on Broadway. I hope that you have enjoyed. If you have already had the chance to see this show on Broadway, let me know what you thought about it in the comments section down below. If you saw it in the West End, feel free to comment about that as well. It's about to go on a UK tour, actually. That just got announced this morning. I'm not sure when you guys are seeing this video, uh, but that has recently been announced, so I'm excited to get to see another UK production of the show in the next couple of years. For now, I hope that you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for plenty more reviews and other theatre-themed videos coming very soon. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh.
Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe!